Hey friends, how are you? It's Mr. McKinney here with Mr. McKinney's Historic Houston. Welcome to another edition of Live from the Heritage Society with Mr. McKinney. Our featured guest today is Allison Bell, as our executive director, talking about the Heritage Society, but also Kimber Fountain, the one y'all been waiting for, Kimber Fountain. So you, hopefully you can hear me okay. Let's talk about the Scanlon Fountain real quick while we wait. This is the beautiful Scanlon Fountain. A lot of history behind Mayor Thomas Scanlon. I'll talk about his legacy in a second, but I just want to show you the fountain itself. Check it out, because this actually set in front of his house. It was built in 1891 out there in the, uh, in the well, it was by the way out in the south end, actually, is where it used to be. I'm going to take this off so you can hear me a little better. But the Scanlon Fountain is important. In fact, more importantly, is Mayor Thomas Scanlon's legacy. Let me talk about him for a little bit while we get close to the church and go and meet with Allison Bell, our executive director. Mayor Thomas Scanlon, um, he was born in Ireland. He comes here to Houston. He actually is very active in a variety of things political. He becomes uh, the um, alderman for the Third Ward. Uh, actually, I'll probably do this. I want you to see it again. Look at that fountain because it's set at his home at 1917 Houston, uh, right in Houston, Texas, downtown, 1917 Main Street and Prairie, uh, sorry, and rather um, uh, the Pierce Elevated is where it's at now. So it's actually the northeast corner of, uh, of Main and Prairie, and, and, and Pierce rather. So there it is. Beautiful fountain. It's actually a bird bath. It is not an actual fountain, but it becomes that later on. It was donated to the Heritage Society, one of the many things that are given to Heritage Society because of the legacy of this awesome space, right? So there it is. Uh, Thomas Scanlon had six, sorry, seven daughters total, okay? Most famous out of those uh, seven daughters is his daughter, Kate Scanlon. She would go on in 1926 to do that beautiful theater you probably heard of. It's called the Ritz Theater in downtown Houston. Uh, and then she would also go on in 1909 to, to open up a building known as the Scanlon Building. And that was on the property that Mr. Scanlon bought. And that property is really significant. That property is really at the corner of Preston and Main Street, okay? Think about that corner, right? We're talking about the corner of Preston and Main. We're talking about the 1909 Scanlon Building, which is our very first skyscraper to be over 10 stories tall, okay? Kate Scanlon breaks with Jesse H. Jones' tradition of having buildings taller than 10 stories and becomes an 11-story building. It was also the first building in downtown to be with a steel frame structure, so it becomes a fireproof, if you will. That property might sound familiar, the corner over there of Maine and, uh, and Preston, because that, of course, is where um, a guy named Sam Houston had the White House of Texas. Now, most people know that Texas was a separate country from 1836 until um, 1845. Nine years, we had our own president, our own vice president, and basically we're a separate country, as we all know. And we had to have a White House where the president would live. We also know, of course, the capital is where the Rice Hotel is. The capital was originally going to be planned for Congress Square, which is actually where Market Square is located. It used to be called Congress Square originally. Pretty cool. Now, Thomas Scanlon's beautiful mansion at 1917 uh, you know, Main Street was actually built by a very important architect here in Houston. You might know the name Eugene Heiner. Eugene Heiner, actually, uh, one of his most grand homes was Mayor Thomas Scanlon's house uh, right there at 1917 Main Street. Now, you might know the name Eugene Heiner also because of his 1885 uh, Cotton Exchange building right there on Travis, Travis and uh, Franklin. Building is still there, lovingly restored and saved, thank goodness. Uh, but that really, that home itself has significance. Uh, and it was actually kind of across the street was actually John Kirby Allen's house. That's right. On Travis, John, John Henry Kirby Allen's house is right there uh, in the 200 block. And, uh, and a bonus question for y'all, how about this? We'll ask you this question later on. Answer it for us. John Kirby Allen, his house was on uh, Travis in between Franklin and... Uh, and, and, uh, and uh, Congress, but what about his brother, Augustus Chapman Allen? Where was Augustus Chapman Allen's house? He had two houses here in Houston, along with Charlotte Allen. One of the houses was the house that, uh, that, uh, that we're not gonna tell you about. The other one, you have to guess, but let me give you a clue. Think real hard to Alfred Finn, and think real hard to uh, this 1929 iconic downtown building. Hopefully you're commenting right now. And by the way, help us out by doing some likes as you're watching the video. Go ahead and like the video. Those, those hearts and those likes that pop up are a big deal to us, as many of you probably important. And in case you're tuning in right now, I'm Mr. McKinney with Mr. McKinney's Historic Houston for the Heritage Society. Have the pleasure of serving on their board, and where we're at now is Sam Houston. And uh, I want to go ahead and introduce you to Allison Bell, who's our executive director. Say hello, Allison Bell. Hello, everyone. Continue the series that we have. We go inside these historical homes. One of the homes that we're in right now, oh, sorry, buildings and structures. Attention, by the way, look at where we're framed at. Look up at this beautiful downtown temple on top. And it's shadowed by this amazing church. So, Allison, let's talk about this church because people want to know. 
Sure, this church was built in 1891 by German and Swiss immigrants. It was located up off of Mangum in 290. It was called White Oak Settlement. Parishioners donated this church to the Heritage Society in 1968. So what I love about it is that they they oriented it exactly the way it was facing east, which is facing Jerusalem. The church itself is an icon in Houston's uh, mini skyline. People look at it all the time. Uh, you know, and we're going to talk, we're going to go inside, of course, shortly, and we're going to talk more about throughout this video some of the great features the church has itself, which also. A shout out to the Parks Department. They just recently painted our church, so it is spot on, beautiful white again with no green algae on the top. So we are taking care of these buildings. You know, it's important too, by the way, this is your park, Houston. It is your oldest municipal park. Yes. Our, our wonderful, uh, you know, collections curator, Ginger Burney, did a really great talk a couple, park, 120 yes. years. People yes. don't realize that. And, and yes, some of y'all might be chiming in that uh, Emancipation Park is 1871, but that wasn't a city of Houston park until 1916, okay? So that means that it wasn't a city park. This is the first city of Houston yes. park. Part of that whole, as Barry Moore says, that city beautiful movement that was sweeping the country in that time period. Right. People wanted to make their city is more beautiful, more attractive, more of an amenity, and they did it with Sam Houston Park. So yes, let's go inside. Yes. Let's yes, do it. Let's go inside. Here we go inside the 1891 St. John's Church. Here we are. Check it out, Houston. This is exciting. Yes, so um, as Mr. Kenny said, the beautiful Gothic windows. Um, and the wonderful thing about the acoustics in here are that the ceilings are curved. They call them coke, but they're curved. And uh, so you don't need a microphone. You don't need anything. You just bring your violin or your guitar or whatever. And yeah. Beautiful. Well, this is great. We're going to go ahead and have a seat uh, so that we can uh, actually let me do this real quick. Let me get this computer on. And then I want to point out while you're getting set up. Yeah, check it out over there. That's great. All right. Well, here we go. Uh, we are good to go. Um, come on in. Thank you all again for joining us. Let me just set up our little sound system over here because we are excited for the last show that we have. And by the way, I want a little shout out to, of course, Michael Bloodworth. That those of you who watched the show uh, last week, you know that Michael Bloodworth did an amazing job. He is always a wealth of knowledge, and he's just, just the kindest person uh, you know, out there able to spread really Houston history. Uh, so it was so wonderful to have him on the show last yeah, week. Yeah, was fascinating. Um, absolutely, 100%. Well, um, like I said, if you're just tuning in now, this is Allison Aries Bell with the Heritage Society. She's the executive director for here. She and her staff manage uh, 10 historic buildings throughout uh, the year now since 1954, 66 years of kind of doing this, which I, I just- I been here that long. Yeah, yeah, really, really. <laughs> uh, but you are a native Houstonian, you know, you've been yes, in Houston for you know numerous years and uh, you know love your city and you could be anywhere, but you choose to be here in Houston. So we, we appreciate you doing that. Well, real quick, let's go over, last week we had the pleasure of a couple of audience members mm -hmm. winning items. Let's kind of go over, uh, let's go over what, uh, what those are. Sure, so our first item was um, the uh, Leah White CD that Mr. McKinney mentioned uh, we sell this in our gift shop, of course, and um, the person, well, let me give you the question that was asked. The yes. question that was asked was, when did the Houston Municipal Airport open? And the answer, in case you all uh, were watching or want to know, was 1928, the year, the year my dad was born. Um, the woman who won that is Sharon Schmidt Sampson. Yay. So congratulations, Sharon. Um, we'll be in touch, and we'll I'll hand deliver it to you if you want me to. I won't touch. No touching. Um, hey, Houston, how are you? It's Mr. McKinney. Then the second item, um, the question was, what company did Michael Bloodworth work for? And that was guessed uh, properly. The answer is Goodyear, the Goodyear Blimp. I believe he brought a shirt and all kinds of items from the Goodyear Blimp Company. And the woman who won that was Diane Boehm, B-O-E-H-M. I'm sorry if I'm not saying that properly. And then, of course, the final item, this wonderful book written by Andrea White um, about the James Baker, or I'm sorry, the Baker Playhouse, um, Secretary Baker's last childhood home with uh, that he all of his ancestors. The question was, what was Houston's first hometown airline? And the answer is Trans Texas Airways. And um, so... Also, Sharon Schmidt Sampson won that as well. 
So congratulations to all the winners and stay tuned for tonight's questions with more door prizes. Yeah, we've got some great questions. I just love the idea of um, uh, those folks chiming in because they were paying attention, they were watching it. So thank you, thank you so much for doing that. And if you just, like I said, tuned in, we're getting ready to have Kimber Fountain on the show, but I wanted to introduce you to the executive director for the Heritage Society, Allison Bell, who worked so hard to, to make this place happen. Um, I think we well, also Mr. have- Mr. McKinney, I have to say thank you for all the hard work you do because you were doing this as a volunteer and I've watched how much blood, sweat, and tears you're putting in. You're buying equipment. You're coming up here every day to get us ready. And so, lots, and I- Lots so, of sweat. Glad you're on our board. Yes, lots of sweat. But thank you because you're doing this out of the uh, kindness in your in your spare oh. time. So thank well, you. Well, that's very kind of you. And I, I, I obviously enjoy doing it. But more importantly, yes. I enjoy promoting Houston history. And that's what I've been doing uh, since 2002 professionally. And we appreciate y'all. Uh, allowing us to do this here and really showcase how great the Heritage Society is. Y'all, if you've grown up in Houston, you know this space, you drive by it every day. If you're new to Houston, you should get to know the space. The idea is we need to get more people to realize the value in saving our history here in Houston. We've absolutely, even in current times right now with the pandemic, you look and see how history repeats itself. So we need to learn yes. from history <laughs> and absorb knowledge from it because we will be a better society if we know where we came from. And uh, we don't have as strong of a preservation culture as other cities do. So that's a call to action yes. to get more young people and more people in general behind Absolutely. preserving some of these wonderful sites so th thank you so much for yes, for, for that I, I appreciate that I also know that it's important that we uh, I have viewer uh, questions because we said yes, if yes. you have questions you're welcome so you, you told me that you had some questions I that did. you I got uh, I, uh, sent in to you and things that were posted so you yeah. can ask questions during this lecture you're also more than welcome to uh, be able to uh, to email us yeah, you know you can do it right now yeah, you can right send now. us questions right now we'll be watching if we've got a great uh, production staff that you can't see right now. So um, yeah, behind they're the scenes. checking on us and they've been great to work with. So thank you to them too. So I'm so, curious, what, I, because I haven't seen these questions and I wanna know oh. what people had to say. This okay, is good. Okay, this is a funny one. What was the green juice that Mr. McKinney was drinking on his show? Uh, Tell him about your green juice. Okay, so I, I get this a lot. I, I um, My friend owns a juice bar, it's called Nourish. Uh, over there, there's two locations. One is on uh, in the Heights on Durham and I-10, and then one is over on um, West Gray. Uh, uh, and she owns a, and she named a drink after me. It's called the Minster McKinney. And full disclosure, I get no money from this drink. They're celery, kale, <laughs> but spinach. But drinking them every day. I drink I them see. every day. I drink them all the time. People have said, "How come I've lost weight?" Well, this is the reason why. So you know, we we always have these around, and we have them on our radio show as well. So go to Nourish and ask for the Minster McKinney. Minster McKinney. Minster McKinney. And she's very kind. And I also have a cocktail. One of my students owns a bar at 110 Main in an historic 1876 oh, Raphael building. Cool. Uh, 100 block of Main is obviously historic. It's right there, right? Commerce in Main. It's called Lillian Bloom, and he named a cocktail drink after me. It's, oh. called the, it's called the Mr. McKinney. It's Hendrix Gin. And what's interesting is I want Chris Bell to do a <laughs> Cocktails at Chris YouTube because he's exploding. Uh, if you don't know this, Chris Bell is the husband of our wonderful executive director, Allison Bell. Uh, he's extremely witty, but he's also very talented as, as a politician, somebody who cares about the city he, he, uh, he's supported over the years and represented. But he's got a great YouTube show, Cocktails with Chris. Cocktails so with Chris. you got to check it out. He talks it's about... very busy. And I only bring this up because it has a history connection. Yes. He talks about the history of the drinks right. and how they were made. And then, of course, he also has dapper outfits that he are regular clothes. Not outfits because what he normally wears. Yeah. But he, 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 he's always in a different uh, outfit outfit matching kind of theme. So anyway, I like We're to mention that. History. <laughs> now, well, more questions, okay, what do we have? So this, this is exciting. Came in. This one is more like a sort of a constructive criticism, which I, I, uh -oh. I appreciated. It makes me um, nervous. No, no, it was, she said that the, she loves watching the live shows, but Mr. McKinney needs to speak a little slower. I know you get so excited and you talk so fast. So, okay, okay. But she loves the content that. and that was the only thing. It's just the speaking a little slower. You know, and I'm sorry that happens. Because you know, so you're, well, Spinning. I'm going a thousand miles a minute, and typically, you know, the great thing about our tours that we give on the history buses, we're always like, you know, it's it's driving. Well, it's it, well, we're driving to a different location, right? Yeah. So we're there, we're talking about it, so it's a little more timed. But when it's a live feature like this, yeah, it's and I'm I'm horrible at cocktail parties. I just rrr, 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 you know, people come <laughs> to me. So, but I'm sorry, but that's good to know. And and whoever sent that, I will yeah, work hard you. at talking slower because it's important I enunciate. It's important that people can hear us. Uh, and I appreciate yeah. that. I, I assume it's it's positive. It's she's positive. saying she likes she loves it. The so. content. So yeah. So yeah, okay, that's good. Okay, what else we got? This is a funny one. Somebody said, "What? What's with that little yellow bus on the table?" Oh, okay. 
Oh, okay. Well, so Thank those of y'all who, who may not know about the Houston History Bus, it's, it's a creation of mine. It is a literally a mobile classroom, a Houston history mobile classroom. It's what I used to teach my school kids about Houston history. I've had the pleasure uh, since 2002 of going into Laporte ISD, Spring Branch ISD, and HISD, and teaching those kids about their local history. Uh, and we do it on board the Houston History Bus. Uh, it's a nonprofit model, so it's free to the public, and people can go onto our site and, and, and check out MrMcKinney.com and learn about the free tours. And that's the whole reason. We, just like the Heritage Society, we're all about education. We really, right. really want people to be educated about their city. That means the world to us. If they can leave, you know, with a little more knowledge, and then I also say a little more civic pride. If you know about your city, you're more likely to get involved, whether it's like your husband yes. through, through elected scenarios and politicians, or whether it's just through cleaning up your communities, you know, volunteering, things like that. And so, edging, catching the kids while they're young to get them interested in history. We want that because yes. we want future preservationists. We yes. want young people. We've got to have and our, our program here at the Heritage is really cool as well. I, I get a real thrill. I know you do too yes. when the school kids are here. Oh, gosh, and those yes. days will come. They'll come back I like everything so. else will come back. Right. But it's neat to be able to uh, impact a young person with knowledge about Houston history. So yeah. uh, what else do we have? And Let's then the last one. Okay. Um, okay, so last week someone was asking why you were – so perspiring so much in that hot Nichols Rice Cherry House. I, um, they can tell. I'm perspiring right now too, but for different reasons because it just it's like I know. Um, so that's that's you know you know what and you you can relate to this too. Just kind of working here and nothing's perfect in nonprofit. Right. It is not perfect. And I will be very honest with you. First off, bless Michael Bloodworth for dealing with this uh, last week because the AC <laughs> went out in the Nichols Rice Cherry yeah, House not that day. And that is a big issue. And yeah. I think it's important to talk about this because first off, most folks out there can probably relate whether you've lived in a home that you've owned or rented it. As a homeowner or someone, you've got to deal with your AC breaking down, your pipes messing up, you've got to paint your, your house every couple of years, all these things that go with managing a house. Mm -hmm. Well, y'all have got those same problems, but times ten. y'all have got them times 10. <laughs> yes. So the AC, the AC did go out uh, and I'm typically high energy, so I'm gonna kind of sweat a little bit, but yeah, the AC went out literally like that afternoon and it was one of those 103 days in houston yes, that we had so it was one of the and hottest that house days faces the west it does when face it west with beautiful tall 12 foot windows mm -hmm. so it was it was hot that day and like i said thank you thank you thank you to michael bloodworth for uh, putting up with it and we made the ac make sure the ac worked over here it, it's it great. typically mm -hmm. always works well in here i think yeah. maybe it's because it's it's just blessed you know oh, very good or maybe just because and it's used for rentals so it makes yes. sense which we'll yes. talk about later yes, on we'll talk about that um, well, I, I'm trying to think of what else do we have I to think, talk about. Um, I was going to talk, talk about the wonderful, this is a wonderful rental facility. Yeah. Um, and I know you have a guest coming soon, oh, yeah. so I'll be brief. But we uh, rent this church out quite often for uh, weddings. It's one of the, our favorite um, events that we have. This church holds 65 people. And as I mentioned earlier, beautiful curved ceilings. So the acoustics are wonderful. Um, right now, of course, for COVID, we I believe we are at... Um, 50%, but who knows what will be. Um, and then um, also um, there are, let's see, we have, um, and I have a wedding that's booked in September um, and I've already rescheduled several. So um, it's just so iconic with the background and then you take pictures in the park. Well, so. let's take a tour. Give me some more uh, pointers and things that are happening uh, real quick. Let's do that. I think that'd be worth our time. So yeah, yes. you know, oh, you know, in fact, tell us, tell us where uh, what, what's that, what, what it says up there? Oh, yes, there. well, I mentioned that earlier. It says, um, bless your going. Well, no, this one says, um, find the word of God and keep it. So we already talked about that one, but I was going to show you this one on the way out. Um, and, and, of course, we've got all these beautiful pews. These were built by church parishioners um, uh, and donated to the Heritage Society. This show was a, a retreat for heat, of course. Um, we've got the certificates on the wall uh, showing when this church was built, and then these wonderful little lanterns. Uh, this church is beautifully decorated during the holidays as well. And uh, we get about six or seven people um, in this. And then the, the, what I wanted to show you on the way out is this says, "Bless you and keep the word of God." And so, and Amen. And then our favorite thing. Oh yeah. So, okay, I want to check this out. So okay, you got to listen to this. This is awesome. Here we go. Yes, the bell. So I have uh, all kinds of people reading, wanting to ring that. So, oh look, here's a Oh my gosh, hey, it's Kimber oh. Fountain. Oh my gosh, it is Houston and Galveston author Kimber Fountain. Here she is, she's here to join us for the live show. 
Thank you hey. for being here. Thanks for joining us. And thank you, Allison Bell, by the way, for the great tour that you gave earlier. Yeah. Well, let's, first off, if, if you are here in the live segment, you can see how awesome Allison Bell described this place. It is available for rental. You have to reach out to her. She does handle all the rentals. So, uh, so definitely reach out to Allison Bell. Well, Kimber, come join us because I know people tuned in just to hear you speak. So go ahead and sit down over here, and then we will get started. Uh, I'll let you get us set up real quick. We'll get started with all that. Okay, Kimber Fountain joining us. Hi, right. everybody. Well, let's see. Is everybody on? Okay, we're good. We're here. Uh, here, let me give you Mr. McKinsey. Oh, I love this. You I were on the before. radio show that we I had, did, so we'll yes. just kind of shake this up. And like I said, full disclosure, I don't get anything from these drinks. I don't need it. They're healthy enough. They feed me up. So cheers. 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 There we go. Okay, that's all good. That's great. It is great. Nourishing. Well. Um, let's dive right in. Kimber Fountain, you, you kind of started out uh, writing for the Galveston magazines, and you, uh, you did this, golly, people just were so enthusiastic about your writing that they probably were hounding you to go out there and to, to do a variety of books, but it was probably that one book that got you started. And by the way, we had a chance to meet and hang out over in Galveston. I think one of the great things about working with other historians like yourself is that you care about history as much as I do. You're absolutely passionate, sure. uh, but you've done a great gift, an awesome mitzvah. You've put them into this you know, book format that people can now have a copy of. So I want sure. you to talk about uh, your books real quick. The first one we'll talk about is the Galveston Seawall Chronicles. Kind of take us, and what we're gonna do, we decided this really kind of as I, as I started putting this uh, show together, and doing the script where we're like, wait a minute, there is way too much information, <laughs> way too much information yeah. with Kimber Fountain to cover in one hour quick segment. So we knew, we knew that we needed to do it in a variety. So we're going to have Kimber come back and talk about her books in depth and individual and or the history because you're a pretty coveted speaker. You know, you speak at a lot of events, you know, on I a do. monthly basis yeah. talking about these different varieties of Galveston history. And you can tell, look at the different Galveston Seawalk Chronicles. She talks about the Red Light District and she talks about the Maceo's, her newest book. What that means is that she's really invested in Galveston history mm -hmm. and there's no one other I think that's passionate about it than, Gal than Kimber Fountain is. So we'll just kind of talk about the history of these areas in, in, in a small format to cover our, our quick 45, one hour segment that we have with you, but I do want you to come back. So I want to tell the audience that we're going to have her come back. So here we go. Um, awesome. Talk about the Seawall Chronicles. Well, uh, the building of the Galveston Seawall and the subsequent, subsequent grade raising is still considered one of the most monumental feats of civil engineering that's ever been accomplished in the history of the United States, not just Texas or the Gulf Coast. And so um, uh, originally, the seawall, it's kind of weird. Right now, it's, it's a straight line, right? But originally, uh, if you're familiar with where Broadway meets the seawall in Galveston, or there's a McDonald's there, it's where the seawall occurs, they're used to, the seawall used to be an L shape, actually. And the eastern arm of the seawall actually actually went down right here, right down 6th Street, right there. But then later on, they decided to extend it, so it went this way, and then they actually filled in this whole area over here east of 6th Street. So, uh, But then the grade raising elevated the entire southern half of the island and estimated 13 feet. So it's just an absolutely amazing story. Um, it's the very first story, I, a history story that I learned when I moved to Galveston originally many years ago, and I was obsessed with it from the beginning. And so... And that's a good, better, uh, better picture of the, yeah. of the and, and what's neat is we all have a seawall story, right? We've all gone to Galveston. Yeah. We've, you know, we've walked the seawall. Sure. We've absorbed the beautiful, clean, well, beautiful, I, I call it sometimes municipal too. Like you're, you're getting refreshed when you go to Galveston. Sure. I, at least I do. I mean, I'm a Gulf Coast boy. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, I know people complain about the water and, you know, being, you know, it's just it silt. It's, it's just it's, silt. It's, well, <laughs> you know, we are to the west of the Mississippi. So the way it's going to happen, yeah, it's exactly. going to come down exactly. to us. It is what it is. Um, you know, but I think it really is refreshing to walk up and down the seawall. But people, and, and then the functions that happen on the seawall, whether they're these awesome bathing beauty contests. Well, that's these... the beauty of this book is that, you know, the seawall, unlike our stoic buildings on the strands that mm -hmm. are, you know, have been there 150 years, the seawall was constantly evolving and changing to keep up with whatever decade it was. You know, how each decade had its trends and its certain stylistic oh, yeah. qualities and aesthetics. And so it was amazing. And I didn't even realize that before I started writing this. But when I started, you know, diving into this history I just realized that you know on the seawall we were constantly tearing down and rebuilding and tearing down and rebuilding this is an example in the 1910s this was electric park um, that was on the seawall here and you can 
see all the people. Basically, at that time, the Seawall Boulevard was actually more like Atlantic City, kind of a boardwalk, you know, horse and buggies, you know, no room for uh, cars or anything, no cars at the time. Um, but this was a big, you know, um, it was a big amusement park. And uh, so, but you can also see, you know, how it's reminiscent of the fun, you know, that's still had on the seawall today, just a, a different decades version of that kind of fun. So. Yeah, and then there's also iconic structures on the sure. seawall that all of us know and oh, recognize. Yeah. Talk about this beautiful, you know, 1911 gem. I would love to. The Hotel Galvez, uh, constructed in 1911, was actually built as a celebration of the completion of the original um, portion of the seawall as well as the grade raising. And, and for context, sure. the, we, we got the seawall, but like, so construction starts in 1902. 1902, it only actually took uh, 21 months wow. uh, to finish the first original arm of the seawall. Of course, wow. they extended it many more times. Mm -hmm. um, to where it's 10.2 miles as it is today um, and so and then elevated you know the grade as well and so this, the grade raising actually took seven years yeah and we'll get to some pictures of that in a minute but the Galvez is an iconic um, this is skipping a couple of decades ahead into like the about the 1950s and uh, but this, you had these little motels all yeah, throughout the city. Yeah, the Jack because, Tar is famous. But Lots people, of people that know was Jack something Tarr. that that was an escape for folks. You know, we it don't was. we don't have you know you know uh, you know mountains and things. We have the beach yeah. in, our, in our area, in our region. So people recognize that. Now this event that happens. Talk about this massive event. We're coming up on the anniversary in September. Sure. What happens in 1900 that changes the, the course of the seawall and or is the reason why we have it? Sure. Uh, September 8th of uh, 1900, um, what would be considered a category four, four hurricane by today's standards struck the island. And okay, so imagine the beach. And now it, it's no, um, no surprise that water is the most powerful force on the face of the planet, right? Look at the Grand Canyon, right? Water did that. And so think about before the seawall was there, the Gulf waters at the behest of 140 mile an hour winds just picking up the Gulf waters and just shoving them onto the island. And so all of this water came in and it just scraped everything off of its foundation from wow. the beachside and created this eight mile long, 20 foot high wall of debris that made like an arc around the downtown area. Strangely, here, it, this is a picture of that debris. Most of the structures are wall. of what material? Now, most of those houses were wood. And so think about everything that's in this wall. Uh, you know, horse and buggies, mm -hmm. uh, baby furniture, you have kitchen stoves, and of course you have bodies, right? And so this was an almost an insurmountable tragedy that struck Galveston. And it's not surprising that the highest point of the storm surge um, that day was 15.7 feet. And uh, the seawall was built to be exactly seven feet, exactly, wow. or just over one foot higher than that storm surge. And that was not random at all. You know, and then, and, and then also, too, the seawall proves itself in 1915. People it don't did. realize mm -hmm. the 1915 hurricane. So, for example, I'm, I'm the president for the Bellar Historical Society, and we talk about this, the idea of this, you know, hurricane similar but not as strong that ends up sweeping through the prairie really in Bel Air and knocks out two-thirds of the homes that are in this brand new mm -hmm. 1908 prairie town that's created in 1915 seven years later so the seawall proves itself to be it valuable mm -hmm. in 1915 when it when it protects the city from it the sure hurricane. Did. And still a hundred years oh, yeah. later, it's still protecting us. And oh, if you I would can... like to know, if during Ike, and if you'd like to know what Hurricane Ike would, would have done to Galveston right. without the seawall, all you have to do is look a few miles to the east at Bolivar Peninsula. Wow. I was actually still living in Chicago at that time, and I remember them doing, you know, the aerial footage. And mm -hmm. we used to vacation in Bolivar when I was a kid. And I literally got up and went to the TV screen screen because there was just nothing left. If you remember Bolivar Peninsula after Ike, there was maybe one house out of every hundred, you know, that was still standing. And, and that's exactly what happened to Galveston. And so the seawall, it has endured the test of time. And it's just amazing. And this is construction of the seawall. These is. photos are mixed back and forth, but you can kind of yeah. tell the curvature, obviously, in the seawall. Those uh, wooden frames. That so they now, put, yeah. people don't realize, in addition to creating the seawall that mm -hmm. helped to save and, and kind of protect Galveston, what is something that people don't realize happened in Galveston around the same time period? Uh, you're talking about the grade raising? Oh my or, gosh. Yeah, oh my gosh. So if everybody, speaking of hurricanes, everybody remembers what happened to New Orleans during Katrina, right? When the levees busted. And that's because the levee was nothing but a concrete wall. Mm -hmm. And so it basically um, enclosed that area of town into like a bowl. And that's exactly what the seawall would have done if it had just been the seawall. And so what our brilliant board of engineers um, who were tasked with um, 
protecting Galveston in the future, what they realized was that it wasn't enough just to build that seawall. We also had to elevate um, the, uh, the elevation of the island to meet the seawall at first, and then it slopes down gradually as you go to downtown. So this is a great example of everyone having to jack up their houses on stilts and, uh, and then they, we dredged in water from the harbor. This was a canal that was actually dredged behind the seawall after it was built. And then it went all the way around to the harbor. And so these are called self-loading hopper dredges. And they would um, suck up silt from the harbor. They would careen down uh, that canal. And then they would attach to these big, um, ho uh, big pipes. And then, as you can see, the water being rushed out. And there were, there were grade raising districts. And so they would build a little levee around each district and then they would pipe this in. Now, this was only 10% silt and 90% water. And so they would pipe it in, they would let the water dry, um, drain off and they would pipe another load in and let the water drain off. And time after time after time until they raised, um, you know, the level of the ground up even. This is a picture of workers that, you know, these boardwalks, go back run, mm -hmm. these boardwalks are really important. This is how people got across that part of the island for seven years. There were boardwalks that attached houses throughout the neighborhoods. Some walkways would actually take you through a parlor of somebody's house, you know, if you were trying to get to work. And this is an example. This is the levee right here as well, one of the levees in one of the grade raising districts. And then here's the silt water before it's drained. So just an absolutely amazing, stunning feat um, that was accomplished in Galveston. And uh, this is a better aerial view of the canal. Now this is about where Avenue Q would be right now. So I think, yeah, yeah. So this is the seawall over here. And then you can see Galveston proper in the back. So this canal was dug. Remember I told you the seawall was an L. So the canal was dug directly 100 feet behind that seawall. And funny enough, they used the land that they, excav for, uh, that they excavated the canal. They put that behind the seawall to create Seawall Boulevard. And then later on, um, used the dredges again to fill back in the canal. So just absolutely monumental. And this uh, is the, the final product. Yeah, that's a later version of uh, the hotel. Galvez and the seawall and you see the granite riprap yeah. they also did it's still there today uh, and to I think later on they put the jetties out there to really had, kind of yeah they actually started doing the jetty system even earlier than that yeah. and that was actually to tr as in an attempt to try Erosion. to deepen the harbor oh, okay yeah because our we were our goal was to be the depth of a first class port because yeah. the deeper your port the bigger ships you can Correct. you can bring in and so and we course, never quite made it but and of course we Houston, got Houston had a you know in 1914 we get to yes. open our, our, our deep water port and really uh, you know, which is interesting town. too. Yeah. I think, well, 1914, we opened our deep water port where it, it currently is now, but mm -hmm. also at the same time in 1914, another important maritime milestone happens, the, the, you know, the Panama Canal opens. Oh, yeah. So think about that. Houston mm -hmm. is uniquely positioned to benefit from the opening of their brand new port and the Panama Canal, brand new deep water port, because we have the 1907 turning basin and we have the Yeah, port and also as well. you uniquely positions to take business away from Galveston. That's too. right. <laughs> but that's okay. We're not bitter. Well, We're and, not bitter. And speaking of business, <laughs> and speaking of business, hey. uh, we gotta talk about uh, these lovely ladies. Yes. Uh, let's talk about Galveston's red light district. Hey. Because this is a interesting book. It, it gets a lot of attention, and it but the, the way that you tell this story is from a, a, diff, a different perspective. You're giving sure. more of a human story to yeah. some of the folks that made this district possible, mm -hmm. and then the reason why they went into this type of business. The reason why. So it the reason why, you know, yeah. absolutely. So let's just kind of dive into uh, Vice sure. and the Red Light District with, sure. with Kimber Fountain. Yeah, you know, the red light district, um, I had severe anxiety for the two months before this book came out because I just wasn't, I, I knew that the, you know, that some people could look at the subject matter and think, oh my gosh, what is this girl doing? You know, what is this woman doing? And, uh, and so, you know, but once it came out, it was so well received, but I think it was because I dealt with a very delicate issue with a very thoughtful and kind of thought provoking approach, um, you know, because I wanted to know why. I wanted to, there were over a thousand girls at a time working in Galveston's red light district and it lasted for almost 70 years. So I knew that there had to be a lot more going on than just a bunch of prostitutes on the street. Um, you know, and so I really wanted to dive into that story and what emerged was a beautiful um, feminist uh, kind of uh, interpretation of what was going on back in our country um, in, uh, in the early, in the mid first half of the 20th century. So this is one of the very few photographs that we have of a Galveston prostitute. Um, this was found in a house that I'll show you a picture of in a moment, but this madam had actually decided to have um, photographs of her girls um, 
uh, commissioned and then she hung those portraits on the wall of the parlor and it was actually a very uh, humanitarian kind of a forward thinking approach um, as opposed to the cattle call kind of meat market uh, that was really the scene at a lot of the madams where they would just like line up all the girls you know and the guys would walk down and and choose their favorite and so. give people some context of where Galveston's red light district was located. I sure will show me all right so where are we on this map this is Avenue this is CY, yeah. 14th so this is 25th Street this is pretty much the main drive like right here is Pleasure Pier all right for today's for today's reference and then over here is the Railroad Museum this is the harbor and then obviously the Gulf of Mexico so the uh, red light district and actually we're over here this is the downtown area so this is market this is church and then post office street is right in the middle it's so funny I can tell when this map was made okay because you notice how there's no western arm of post office streets um, on this map and that is because in the late 70s and early 80s to the best of my knowledge they built this substation right here right in the middle of 26th street and, and post office and so it basically cut off the whole western part of post office street from the rest of the town and uh, so it's so funny i've actually this is uh, mr mckinney's map here that he pulled up and i've never seen that and that is that is absolutely amazing how they were just basically trying to erase it from history and I guess they weren't counting on me coming along in 2018, <laughs> right? Um, this is one of the brothels that actually operated on the interior of downtown. This is on 20th Street in between the Strand and Harborside. Now, the, um, the, the brothels that operated on the interior of downtown had to be a lot more clever. The whole female boarding house cover that, you know, was going on on Post Office Street wouldn't really fly downtown. So what Madams did and several business owners was take these commercial buildings and then they would open up a legitimate business on the bottom floor here. And then they would, and see this little bitty door here? This door actually conveniently goes straight to a staircase, um, straight to the, up, um, the upper floor. And so the brothel would be upstairs. Now this building, you'll also notice, you can barely see it. It says 114 in front of that door and then 116 in front of the little door. So in the city directories, um, 114 20th Street was listed as the Rainbow Club. It was a gambling club with drinking and some slot machines and things like that. And then 116, was, a nick was named the Rainbow Room. So if you were perusing uh, the uh, city directories, you'd know which door to go into. <laughs> Um, this is another one of a later brothel, actually, after uh, the line shut down, which, by the way, the line is simply a nickname for Galveston's district. But um, these madams, the madams who got kicked off the line moved, get this, one block away over to Market Street. And they operated there for another 10 years after the district had been shut down. But they actually took a cue from those madams who had operated in downtown and they did the same thing. So you see the little bitty door right here. Um, so you would go straight up to the staircase there. And then um, in 1958, this building was listed as the Welcome Inn, um, I-N-N, -N, Welcome Inn, but still got a little ring to it, right? Um, and, uh, and so and it listed uh, that the building had a restaurant. So this um, a bottom area here was where the restaurant was, and then the uh, upstairs was where you were welcome in. <laughs> um, all right, we flip through, all right, where are we? Okay, this is a house of another madam. This house is actually still standing. I'm about to show it to you. This house has since been demolished, as are, have most of the houses on actual Post Office Street. But this um, house was owned by a woman named Lula Wilcox. And the next slide will show you her, oh wait, maybe not, um, uh, her business card, or her, we'll, we'll get to it in a second. Yeah. Okay, so this lattice, is actually, was actually a very distinct feature of the brothels in, on the post office streets because this was not an open door policy. You didn't just walk in. Um, you had to be vetted and screened. And so the madams would install the lattice so that the men could wait to be let inside and not be seen from the streets. And that's just one of many examples of um, the discretion um, and uh, believe it or not, the class that many of these madams and girls operated with in Galveston's district. Um, it, I equate it to honor among thieves. Uh, you know, um, if they were gonna do it, they were gonna do it right. In fact, someone from the Maceo family told me the best line ever. He said, it might not have been right, but it sure was proper. And uh, so that was our district. This is one of the only known photographs of a madam from Galveston on the bottom left. Her name was Mary Russell. They called her Gouch Eye, because you see her over a little eye. Right there, it's kind of funny. Now, uh, Mary became one of the most successful uh, madams in Galveston history, and you can see why, right here. Um, she um, specifically hired college girls. Uh, to work in her brothels. They would actually come down to Galveston and they would work and save for college tuition. 
and, uh, and then go back from whence they came and they didn't have to tell anybody what they had been doing. That was a big um, feature of Galveston's district was anonymity. Wow. These women could come down here and work and uh, nobody and they would be any the wiser. Like this one looks 16. Oh yeah, yeah. They, look, they look like secretaries that just walked off of an, you know, out of an office building. Very but true. this is what Mary Russell ran what were called high-end brothels and those girls were expected to be well and immaculately groomed at all, at all times and not belie their profession when they were in public. Look at that. As well. So this is the house from where the, um, the first photograph came. Um, so this was a house originally owned by a woman named Molly Waters, who arrived to the, uh, Galveston in the 1880s. And she actually built this house oh, wow. in 1886. And that makes this house a treasure because it's one of the only houses um, that we know of, at least, uh, that was built ex to, to be a brothel, as mm. opposed to all the other houses converted. that were kind of, yeah, converted yeah. that were already wow. the houses that were already there. That makes there. it unique and special. It Interesting. does, it does. So this was Lula's card I was talking about earlier. Earlier. Um, so 2526 Avenue E and uh, you can see rooms because she was just a boarding house. It was just a boarding house. <laughs> I love that they had business card. Look at this. Yeah. Um, this is another house that was a 2705 Post Office Street and it's now demolished a little further west from Lula's and from Mary Russell's that we saw. And uh, so as you can see, you know, this area of town had originally been actually a pretty elite street. Um, and now this wasn't a huge, massive house, but you can tell by the trim and the windows and such. And this house is already 100 years old at this point. So, you know, this was these were nice little beach cottages built by Texas Senator wealthy ranchers from all across Texas, but the cityscape of Galveston kind of shifted that had severely diminished the real estate value of this side of Post Office Street mm -hmm. that had nothing to do with the district, um, but that made them ripe for the picking. Uh, for uh, This is across the street, uh, 2710 Post Office. Now this house right here is still standing. Um, and uh, this house um, is gone, so is this one, but this is actually gives you a really good idea because at first this looks like one house, but this is actually two different houses because it shows you that there were actually houses all down the alleyway as well because um, that house is behind this one. Um, so it wasn't just post office street, it was all the side streets, it was the two alleyways um, that were ran on the south and north sides of post office street. So um, during the Great Depression is when it reached its peak and employed over 1,000 girls at a time. Wow. Yeah. Um, this was a um, pushback. Yeah, a little pushback. Yeah. Now in Galveston, these pamphlets were pretty much used as kindling. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that was about it. But um, there was an organization called the ASHA, uh, which stood for the American Social Hygiene Association. And uh, they were relatively successful in closing down districts all over the nation, but it took them almost 15 years uh, to close Galveston's, and they had a lot of help. So, had to have a lot of help from that. All right. Let's jump into your newest next. book. And yes, sir. Why that's exciting is because this is an authorized history. It is. And I think I think as you just saw and heard the last uh, you know two books that she talked about, for example, in, in small uh, you know segments because we're going to have Kimber Fountain back on. If you're just tuning into Facebook Live or Instagram Live, we appreciate you doing so and learning about Houston history, local history, Galveston history, our area. We're in the St. John's Church. Here is her newest book, which is about the Maceos. It's called The Maceos and the Free State of Galveston, an author authorized history. And like I said, in order to get certain families, especially notable families, to open up, you have to be knowledgeable, you have to be respected, and you have to be somebody who people really think they can, you know, do it justice. And sure. you sure have with this book. So let's talk about... Well, the... let me tell you first how the book came to be, because yeah, I think oh, yeah, people want to know why please. you and why were you authorized yeah. to do it. Um, and, uh, you know, I started studying the Maceo history back in 2008, actually, over a decade ago. And, um, and I immediately saw, the first thing that I noticed was that and the red light history had kind of been brushed under the rug and mm -hmm. nobody was talking about it. And the people who were talking about it were constantly referring to the Maceo family as mafia and mobsters and gangsters. And that's not what I saw. Yeah. When I saw this history, I was like, wait a second. These guys weren't hanging people from bridges like the Mexican cartel. There was no St. Valentine. Day massacre, like you know, in, in Chicago, it was like there was something about this family that was sure it was organized, and sure there were some elements of their um, of their enterprise that were illegitimate by the law standards, but they weren't violent and they weren't coercing people, and that's why it was called the Free State of Galveston. And so, in my first two books, I actually covered the Maceo history pretty extensively. And so get this, so I actually had 
the release party for the Red Light District book at Maceo's downtown. Oh, okay, okay. All right, because I've Which been, makes sense. It's yeah. downtown, not too far from the post well, office. Well, and actually, Market Street area. is where some of those brothels True. were, and they're the only ones that still existed. Ah. And so it was a perfect area, and it was didn't have anything to do with the Maceo's having to do with prostitution. Sure. It was just because that street. Yeah. And I love Concetta, Maceo. Yeah. Hi, Concetta. And you want to support um, local, too. Exactly. Which support is important. Local, support local always. businesses. And so about a, uh, two nights before the release party, I get a text message from Concetta, and she says, uh, Kimber, my dad wants to know if you said anything negative about my family in your Red Light District book. And I said, well, let me just tell you. Now, I've known Concetta for a long time at this point, but she didn't really know how deep my obsession with her family history had gone, <laughs> was at that point. And so I said, let me just tell you, not only do I not talk bad about your family, it's actually the exact opposite. Um, you know, Galveston, you know, the Maceos carried uh, Galveston through the Great Depression, through World War II, through some of the most trying economic times in our country's history. And they ushered in this era of prosperity and opulence and glamour that has never been duplicated. And so um, she said that after she read my text message to her dad, that her dad kind of had tears in his eyes. Like he oh, got wow. misty because he had never heard anybody talk about his family the right way. Um, and so then we had the party, went off splendidly. And a couple of days later, I showed up to pay the bill. And um, that's when uh, she had said she had talked to her dad and her uncle and um, they wanted me to write the book. And it was just one of those things, you know, if I'd have walked into Maceo's five years ago sure. and said, hey, I want to write a book about your family. <laughs> you know, be I would have been- They might be a little yeah, bit, Yeah, exactly. Just... I would have been laughed out of the place. And so it was just beautiful to develop this because Concetta is an amazing person to develop a friendship with her and then to nurture the history in my first two books and then have it all culminate into being asked to write it was just, I mean, wow. that's really a historian's dream come true, you know? Yeah. That is great. And sure. I just love the idea, like I said, that the family, you know, uh, you know, sure. connected with you in the way And even did. so, and even still, you know, Ronnie, Concetta's dad, uh -huh. uh, just read it and he, and Concetta told me he was on the phone calling everybody saying, there is stuff in this book that I didn't know anybody knew, you know, because um, even though, you know, I did, um, you know, interview family members, that I still did some very, very in-depth, a very mm -hmm. deep dive into the family. And I was able to, um, you know, uncover some, some interesting theories and, and were you ever able to about, cover them in the magazine in the monthly magazine that you wrote for over the I years, covered or? the business I covered okay. the current business gotcha. I okay, sure did sense. Yeah. but this is great because now you can dive in the family stories yeah. so kind of take us through the two Maceo brothers or the Maceo family in general sure Let's sure well, at the center of the Maceo empire were two brothers originally from Sicily named Salvatore and Rosario Maceo affectionately known as Sam and Rose right here is a photograph of Rose this is Rosario right here um, they just called him Rose Maceo. Now, Rose Maceo became one of my favorites when I was researching because he was so misunderstood, all right? But unlike, you know, everybody in life wants to be understood, right? Yeah, and usually yeah. a lot of times we get really bent out of shape when people don't understand us, but man, Rosario was just iron and uh, he didn't care and he actually used all the rumors that circulated around uh, the family to his benefit. Um, one of the biggest rumors about Rosario was that he was the enforcer, you know, was that he was the big, you know, deadly guy. Um, but actually I was able to kind of, you know, um, dive into where that rumor came from. Mm -hmm. And really it only stemmed, um, otherwise from any, no, no, no activity of Rosario that was documented, but that rumor, um, stemmed from, uh, a, a thought that he had killed his first wife. That oh, was wow. the rumor that was going on that Rosario Rose had murdered his first wife. Well, I did the digging and in 1921, sure enough, one of the Rosario's brother's wives did die, uh -huh. but it was not Rose's wife. It was their brother Vincent's wife. She was actually found with her head bashed in. Um, oh, wow. Her body was found yeah. over like off of Stewart Road and 61st in that area. There used to be just brush mm -hmm. over there before it was developed. And uh, so, but the murder was never solved, but it was one of those, you know, like the game of telephone where one person says something oh, and sure. by you get to the end, it's different. Rumors are all and so, there, yeah. but you know, but the genius part of what Rose did is that he never refuted it. He never, you know, he never made some big statements, you know, trying to clear his name. Um, but um, he wasn't, he was not a brutal guy. He simply used that reputation to kind of keep some people in line. That's all you needed was the reputation. You oh, know? Yeah. yeah. All right. So this is his brother, Sam, right here in the middle. Mm -hmm. 
And by the way, if you're a New Orleans, um, uh, a New Orleans history junkie, this is Seymour Weiss over here on his left, uh, the Maceos and Seymour, who was a big hotelier in New Orleans. They were thick as, uh, they were thick, uh, and friends. I was about to say thick as thieves. They weren't thieves. I didn't want to give the wrong impression. <laughs> um, they were thick. Uh, yeah, so Sam was the dapper one, and he was the one with all of the charm and all of the charisma. And the best part about Sam, and really the entire Maceo family was like this, they were so all-inclusive. They could make the bartender and the janitor feel just as royal as the oil tycoon coming down from Houston to gamble at their clubs. You know, they just, they just hospitality was this, king. Yeah, it, but it was it was even more heightened than just hospitality. Mm. It was like this this diplomacy that came sure. from a very genuine place. You know, they were very compassionate people. They grew up penniless, you know, in Sicily, and they had to, they immigrated, you know, all the way, you know, through New Orleans in, on a horrible two week long, you know, boat ride with no plumbing and, you know, all of this. And, and they specifically left Sicily to escape the conditions that the mafia had exacerbated there of the extortion and, and all of that. And um, so they never forgot where they came from. But they had, they had great success. They did have great you success. You know, so let's talk a little about their, their business savvy and they're, sure. they're, they're not, I guess it's luck. But luck is when opportunity is preparation. Exactly. So they were the right people, the right time, the right place, the right city. It, and the, talk well, about that. And the right vision. Yeah. And, and the right motive mm -hmm. as well, too, because they really did have a genuine love for Galveston. And so everything that they did was really fueled, not necessarily by profit, but by what can we do to enrich the whole of Galveston. And so, uh, you know, they, they started in business roughly around 1920. And uh, so then by 1921, they had opened up their very first restaurant um, off the seawall that would later become the world famous Balinese room. Uh, then in 1926, they opened up the Hollywood Dinner Club. Uh, and then that was followed by their official headquarters called the Turf Athletic Club. Now, Turf Athletic Club was not a club. That was just the name of the business, the umbrella business. This is the Hollywood. This was on the corner of 61st and Stewart Road. There's a convenience store where this used to be now, unfortunately. Um, but it was, you can tell, it was built in the Spanish Italian style, a Spanish Renaissance style with the barrel tiled roof and uh, the floor to ceiling windows. It was the very first place in the United States where you could find high-end gambling, high-class entertainment, and gourmet food all under one roof. Yeah. Now today, that is a very normal thing. We call it Las Vegas. But it's a very little known fact that the Maceos, it was the Maceos in Galveston, our little bitty 32 mile long island that actually pioneered that template that would later um, be picked up by uh, the- And you mentioned the Turf Grill or the I Turf Club I mentioned the Turf Athletic so, Club, yeah. Club was a building down on Market Street and the Turf Grill was on the bottom floor. So this was another one of their restaurants. This was the inside, a little lounge area. It's so cool, look at that. that as well. So I mean, they so were just, they were so stylish and so yeah. fashionable. It was really, really great. Um, now, so, most people know yeah. their legacy from this iconic seawall structure. So talk about what we're looking at now. Sure. Now, this is the Balinese Room. Now, the original restaurant that they had built on, on this property was about right here. It was right off the seawall, right? Then they decided to um, change it and open up a gambling club in the back of the restaurant. And so they built a 200-foot pier and then put the restaurant in the gambling club. But then that club got raided several times and then the Hollywood Dinner Club over on 61st got raided and um, and Sam and Rose were really exasperated um, and so they decided that their ultimate goal was to build a raid proof club and so they constructed a 600 foot pier that jutted out because of the angle it doesn't look that long but I promise it was um, over the Gulf of Mexico and then the restaurant it was a T at the end there was a T head and the restaurant was in the base of the T and then the gambling rooms um, were in the top of the T and so this this walkway here it was covered and it had this beautiful carpet and little sconces at every several feet but it was um sardonically nicknamed Ranger Run after the Texas Rangers because um, they had to run um, down there to try to bust them gambling so up front in the foyer there would be um, uh, you know the maitre d or the hostess mm -hmm. And she had an alarm that she would press and it would send alarm bells off in the back gambling room and they would um, enact this presto changeo thing and uh, it was really quite miraculous. They had trap doors underneath the bar where they could uh, ditch the liquor bottles. By the way, prohibition had been lifted at that point, but liquor by the drink mm. was still illegal in Texas until like the 1970s. Of course, liquor by the drink was readily available in Galveston. And so this and is the original front. Go ahead. That, no, I was gonna say, because yeah. this is on the cover of your new book, 
Uh, again, the Maceos and the Free State of Galveston by Kimber Fountain. If you're just joining us now, we're with Kimber Fountain, Galveston, three-time Galveston author about the history of Galveston, and of course, historian. We'll talk more about her in a little bit as well, which what all she does, because she does a lot in Galveston that you need to know about that. But this original, uh, you know, art modern like structure facade in the front is different than what we all think of the it iconic is. Balinese room that yes. most of us think of which came much later but this That's is an it. original photo this is an original photo from probably around 1940 no I'm sorry it was opened in 42 probably around 45 mm -hmm. around there and uh, yeah and you can tell the art deco now this is a this is an artist rendering of the interior this is the Ranger run right here so you see the patterned they had this palm frond carpet and these beautiful sconces and chandeliers over here was the dance room dance floor and on each four corner of the corners of the dance floor these were copper palm trees that were interwoven with neon lights wow. and then they had this fish netting with black lights and and uh, globes and it was just such a scene sometimes I like close my eyes and try to like <laughs> imagine myself um, still inside there um, this is one of the lounges they had little lounges off the side of the dining room and then this is another one of those lounges with an aquarium and that was actually a massive aquarium for the time it doesn't look too big by today's standards but back then that was uh, that was a pretty big deal. And like I said, this is what we think of this when we think of the Balinese room. Of the Balinese room is this Asian facade. Mm -hmm. But it's a very little known fact that that facade was actually not put into place until 1965 when Johnny Mitchell purchased the Balinese room from auction. And I uh, just decided to, I guess, um, you know, make it match its name a little bit more, yeah. you know, um, that, what's it called, mimetic yeah. architecture. Um, marketing, you know. too. You know, yeah, and marketing, you exactly. Saw that with Seawall. But it's, it's funny because, you know, you think about generationally, that happened in 65, so almost, you know, most people who are alive now, you know, that's all they years, know. You know. Exactly. Yeah, I mean. There's a lot more people that were, have been alive since this was the facade than there were since that had been the facade. And so it's a common, um, it's a common mistake that's made but this so this is and what happened to the Balinese room for those of not not yeah. you know, from Houston tell us all the, the well 2008 uh, Hurricane Ike uh, September 13th of 2008 now here you can see you know that the top of that facade but these are the huge waves crashing over right before Ike really made landfall this is just the beginning of it but the thing is you know uh, Mr. McKinney is that I was you know when I was researching the book I came across some photographs mm -hmm. of the of the revamped Balinese room. Okay, so after it was, uh, so Johnny Mitchell let it go, and then it was picked up in, I think, 2002, somewhere around there, um, by a, a business owner named Scott Arnold, who is great. Oh, yeah. He's a he's a very well known entrepreneur in our town, and he's got he's you know launched some amazing concepts and really done a lot for our local economy, uh, including you know he still has the lease on the current Balinese room. Um, but one thing that I noticed when I was looking at these pictures were, you know, the interior. Of the Balinese that during you know the 2000s they had metal chairs and plastic tablecloths so. and the guy on the stage was wearing like ripped blue jeans you know oh, and, wow. and I was like you know and so to me it was almost so like symbolic better. yeah it's you better know? that it's gone exactly that's you yeah. know not oh. to say I would I don't wish that well, on you anybody. know the history and you know exactly yeah, and, and, and yeah. I think like like so many of us who in the history in the history community that you know lecture or write books or do presentations we feel like we know these people yeah you and, know, the places, intimately, and the places too, yeah. well enough because we're really kind of engulfed in yeah. all the background information about it so sure. yeah i think when you see something you love and care about kind of just just uh yeah go, go to that level you're, you're really just kind of wishing that you yeah. remember what it used to be so i can relate to that as exciting as it was to have that homage sure. and, and that tribute to the balinese like were we really doing it justice? No, if that, you know, no yes. offense to anyone in, involved in it, but you know, and I understand there there might currently until if and when we ever legalize gambling, there might sure. not be you know a market for that high ends. But you know, I think people will rise to the level of your expectations as well. Yeah. You know, when it comes to business and anything, and so who's to say it wouldn't be you know a premier you know night spot? So it could be. You never yeah. know. This is actually a family heirloom. Now the Sui Ren, as it's pronounced. Um, was actually that very first rest, the 200 foot pier restaurant yes. I told you prior to the Balinese room. Not the first one. This is a family heirloom. So this is an invitation um, to opening night, as you can see, November 2nd, 1932. And uh, then Sam Maceo's signature up there. And uh, so, and you see Hollywood Dinner Club management up here. Takes pride and pleasure in announcing the opening within a few weeks of a new and distinctive dine and dance club on the site formerly occupied by the Grotto. Yeah, and then prior to that, 
It was even And this is an example of things that you got access to that's in your book. Exactly, that you'll rare. never see anywhere yeah, else. Yeah, and that's why it's worth you know learning more about that. And we're going to sure. uh, let people know. There's by, by the way, there is a link in the bio for the video uh, on the Heritage Society page that takes you to Kimber's site yeah. and where you can purchase the book, especially directly now. And me. Directly, yeah, and that's it's important. You know, you get it signed, but more mm -hmm. importantly, you support local uh, sure. local authors and artists because yeah. I think as as, as someone who tells stories, you know, you're a performer. Yeah. Uh, you know, but you're supporting local by doing it directly through Kimber Fountain. So yeah. consider that. And then now you've got something to read and learn more about it as we talk about it. So uh, this is a fun little uh, little cartoon. I love this. And this this helps me illustrate, you know, I mentioned earlier, you know, the level of opulence that, you know, the Maceos had ushered in. So this is a comic that was in a magazine that was actually published by Sam Maceo. Oh, cool. It's so funny to go back and find out that he was a publisher of a magazine and I was, you know, writing for a magazine. You know, it's anyway. like Glenn McCarthy. He, was in, he had newspapers. He had yeah. radio stations. So these people that we think of as doing this, if sure. you dig more and dive more, yeah. you realize they had so many, like an onion, sure. so many layers. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, the, the Maceo empires by the end of it, first of all, it was almost entirely legitimate by the end of it. Um, but so, this is a comic of the interior of, I, I like to call it the Galvez, I don't know if it's the Galvez or not, it's a really <laughs> fancy hotel, right? And you have Mr. and Mrs. Cowboy in their little boots and their cute little hats, right? But the best part is, you go down to the caption and you hear them asking the maitre d', are you sure this is Texas? <laughs> and so that just gives you a great idea of really what the Maceo's achieved here in Galveston like any kind of image that you can conjure in your imagination about 1930s Hollywood glamour that is what was happening in Galveston you know at the time it was amazing it's awesome. and it, it's it's obviously exceeding their expectations because as sure. uh, they're, they're coming to visit and what do they do in Texas they wear their you know they the, wear the rodeo get up their hats, and their hats yeah. and their hats you know and I, I love that because I've, I've bumped into people that think that we all ride horses to work in Texas oh, yeah. you know and it's like no well no. sometimes we perpetuate it my mom tells me a story of some friends of hers that they never wore cowboy hats and boots unless they went out of state oh yeah and then <laughs> just to proclaim the, their presence yeah, you know, 100% Texas. you gotta, you gotta yeah. keep it going um, yeah. And then now, now famous people yeah. uh, also, you know, frequented the Balinese sure. room and all of the Maceo's, you know, uh, you know, projects and properties. Talk about uh, Jack Benny and some of the oh, people yeah. that did that. We have this famous guy. This is great. This is Sam Maceo in the middle here. But you notice this this really uh, look on Jack Benny's face here. So Sam, you see the smile on Sam's face. This is a great story, this is guys. One of my favorite stories. So Sam Maceo had decided to prank. Jack Benny, and he told the waiter um, that was waiting on them to bring Jack Benny the check, <laughs> even though he was their guest. And so obviously, um, Jack Benny was used to being the funny guy himself and wasn't really too pleased about Sam Maceo getting one over on him. So that is right after that happened. And, oh, I you know, love that. Yeah. And, then, and then, of course, the Italian connection. Who can offer for oh, the yeah. Look at this. Old blue eyes right here, Mr. Frank Sinatra. Now, um, this is Rosario, by the way, Rose. And there's Sam. I'm sorry, that is not. This is Fertitta. This is Anthony Fertitta. I'm sorry. It's a lot of them look alike. <laughs> this is Rose. Uh, Sam over here. So here's the thing about Frank Sinatra and one thing that is... Clear this up because people, people we'll say this, this you know. Yeah. I mean, not, not on your tours, but other people probably are out there they saying it. They do. They are out there saying it in lots of places. Like, no, don't say it. In fact, I think my book is almost one of the first places it's ever said Definitive, correctly. Yeah. yeah, but um, Frank Sinatra actually never sang a note in Galveston. But um, through, like, now the Maceos in the late 40s had decided to venture into um, Las Vegas because they really wanted to be a place in a place where their business was no longer illegal, right? They really wanted that. And so through, they were actually part, um, they were partner investors. There were many other investors, but both Sinatra and the Maceos were part investors of the Sands uh, Casino uh, originally. Uh, in the late, I'm sorry, in the late 40s. And so that's how they became friends. Well, Frank Sinatra, as we all know, was quite the womanizer, right? And so occasionally he would um, foray um, with uh, one of his mafia boss buddies' wives or one of their daughters or something that would make them mad. And so he would have to go hide out for a little while until things cooled off. And uh, he would always, he would come to Galveston and he would hang out at Grandma Maceo's house, actually, and they would hide him. Now, for Sam's benefit, he would make some appearances. This is him dining at the Balinese room, you know, simply to uh, bring uh, bring some, you know, some uh, notoriety and some glamour. Uh, but, and but some because press. all the papers would cover it, if he all of a sudden shows up at the Balinese room, of everybody's course. talking about it, you know, the of next course. day. 
and it just kind of, ooh, yeah. he's going to come back the next week. Who and knows? And so then it was just actually kind of assumed that yeah. he performed in Galveston, which he actually never did. I love that. Yeah. Now, it, I, now let's yeah. talk about the next generation. You Yay. said her name earlier. Who's the next generation of Maceo's in, in Galveston we should oh, know about? All right. So the third, I'm going to go back up because I really yeah. want people to know how the current Maceo's who are running it are connected to sure. Sam and Rose. And because I was actually the first historian that was ever able to accurately and completely dissect the Maceo family tree. Even even some living family members didn't even know what I figured out about their family lineage, so it was really fun. Um, but anyway, so Sam and Rose, uh, I won't give you the whole detail, but Sam and Rose, it's not really a tree, it's a family bush, right? And so Sam and Rose had this whole set of cousins on the opposite side. Um, back in 19th century Sicily, two Maceo brothers married two sisters. So they created these two branches of the Maceo family. So that's why whenever you read about the Maceos anywhere, it's always talking about cousins. Cousin this, cousin, everybody's a cousin. But that's why, because all of their children were double cousins, because their mothers and their fathers were related. So... On the opposite side of the bush from Sam and Rose was their cousin Frank, and he was the third largest investor in the Maceo Empire, second only to Sam and Rose. Well, Frank had several children, one of whom uh, was our, also named Rosario, but his oh. nickname was Slick Maceo, mm -hmm. whose birthday was actually yesterday, Aww. or the celebration of his birthday was yesterday. And uh, so Slick was a, had the Maceo magic, right? And so he decided to open up a Maceo Seafood Company in 1944. And then shortly after that, um, invested again and expanded again and opened up Maceo Spice and Import Company. And so it is currently owned and operated by Slick's son, who's Ronald mm -hmm. Maceo, and Ronald's daughter, Slick's granddaughter, oh. Concetta Maceo. So Concetta and her dad, Ronnie, um, are the descendants of the third largest investor in the Maceo it, Empire. I think she has a, a show, right? The Cooking with Concetta? Cooking with Concetta, yeah. She's so talented. And talk about these items. We have these oh. little door prizes. We're, because in honor of Kimber Fountain and, of course, honor of Concetta Maceo. And we, so I had the pleasure of going to the Maceo a Spice and Import Company. She donated these two items here for us to give away. So we now have five questions and five prizes that we're going to be doing at the end of this video, which is going to happen very shortly in a couple of minutes. So stay tuned for these prizes and yeah. these questions because you have to chime in to let us know the answer to them. But there she is, Concetta Maceo, so kind. Uh, they've been around since 1944, the Maceo Spice and Import Company. Um, and I want to thank you again, Kimber Fountain, for thank sharing you. your knowledge. It was absolutely a pleasure to be able to learn about Galveston history and the way that we learned it with you. You're hyper, high energy. I, I love the idea of, of the way that you spread Houston and, and Galveston history specifically. Sure. And we're going to have you back to talk about these topics, I think, when we, when we do uh, yeah. our, our, our live audience, which will hopefully be in a couple of months as, as things kind of get better. Definitely. Uh, because we are looking forward to doing things. And yeah. we've got a really awesome board member at the Heritage Society, Kirksey Gregg Productions, who did this amazing Thing for us that you're going to learn more about as you stay tuned to the Facebook page and the Instagram and the Twitter of the Hair Society. So stay tuned to that. But let's ask let's ask the audience some questions real quick. We've got five items here. Uh, first off, you have we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it as we go through them. So let's start with the Galveston Seawall Chronicles book. This book is autographed by Kimber Fountain. Her first book. It is signed. It's the first prize we're going to give away. There it is. You're going to get that book if you can answer a question right about the Galveston Seawall Chronicles, oh. the first section we talked about. So give them one question oh, that they are um, that they're going to have. Should it be something I talked about, right? Yeah, okay, of course. Okay, so, something, all right. Something um, in it, so, how long did the construction of the seawall take? I okay. mentioned that, right? Or if you can even get the years. The year it started. How, how about the start of it? The start of it. Okay, okay. so the start, we're looking sure. for a date. We're looking for the start of the Galveston Sea. Well, when did construction start? Because as Kimber Fountain mentioned earlier, it had phases, so it would kind of uh, be completed in phases, and that's hard to kind of grasp. But the idea of it starting is a big milestone for Texas, has saved our butts in our region mm -hmm. numerous times, and sure. I'm sure people in Tiki Island and Texas City appreciate it too. Yeah. That Galveston Seawall. So that's the question. When did the Galveston Seawall start construction? Okay. Next question is going to be about the Red Light District, Galveston Red Light District, the history of the line by, once again, Kimber Fountain, an autographed copy. There it is. We need you to ask us questions. Um, what was one of the reasons that I mentioned that uh, girls would actually come to Galveston to work in the line, on the line? Remember, I showed you a picture yeah. with the madam and the girls that were with her, and I specifically mentioned that they were in Galveston uh, saving money for actually a very noble cause. 
And uh, if you can remember what that was, you, okay. you're the winner. You're the winner of the book. There you mm -hmm. go. Okay, now let's do your last book, or your current book rather, not your last book, because I don't think you're done. I think <laughs> she'll be doing multiple books about Galveston and our regional history because uh, no one can do it like Kimber Fountain does. Let's talk about the Maceos and the Free State of Galveston, your, your, your current book, uh, which is available. They're all available on your website, but let's ask a question about this one question, which is hard, about the Maceos that someone can answer to win this item. Actually, we're going to have three questions about the Maceos okay. because we have have this Concetta barbecue rub, okay? Uh, set a Q. Set a Q. Set a Q barbecue My, rub. Our favorite. Autograph. This almost on everything. Autograph by her. Now, and all of their all of their and spices, they have no preservatives, no MSG, no anti-caking agents, none of that. It's all fresh, and um, all, they're all blended in house. Yeah, no, no, you're, exactly. So there you go. Um, the next thing is, so wait, and then ask. So you have three okay, questions. Okay, so three questions. So you let's do pick. an easy one for okay. for the first spice. All right, the easy question is what year, what year was Maceo Spice and Import founded? Woo, I'm knocking things over here. Um, don't, I, don't want, I don't want you to cheat because it's on the thing, but that, so that's question number one. Okay, so, so we'll turn right. the bottom, perfect. So what yeah. year was the Maceo Spice Company, Spice and Import Company founded? That is the very first question. It's an easy question. You probably can Google it, but if you paid sure. attention to our little segment earlier, you would have told us. So keep All going. right, I've got another easy one for round two. I'm going to cover up the date again just so we don't give it away. What was the nickname of Concetta's grandfather who started Maceo Spice and Import Company? It's the most Italian nickname ever in the whole world. Just give you a hint. Okay. All right. Okay, I'm there you go. Out. All right, so okay. the big whammy. The big one, here it is. Um, uh, what was the name of the very first luxury gambling house opened by the Maceos? It was on Ooh. the corner of 61st and Stewart Road. Okay. And it was the, I remember, remember I said it was the very first place in the nation where you could get hot gourmet food, high-end uh, entertainment, and uh, high-end gambling. All in Hooray for that answer. Okay, there you go. I won't give yeah. it away, but it is going to be, again, if you watched our video, and you can always go back and watch it, but there you go. This is a wonderful, but now, if they didn't win these these items here, yeah. and they didn't get a book, where can people get a hold of you? Where can they follow you? Where can they like you? Sure. And tell people also what you do beyond the wonderful writing that you do, yeah. because it's kind of also what you're known for as well. Um, I think she's so innovative in what she does. So you tell about it, and I'll, I'll okay. drop in some tidbits, but go for sure. it. Sure. Well, um, I am the editor-in-chief of Galveston Monthly Magazine on the island. I've been with them since 2015. And actually, it was my publisher, uh, John Hall, who planted the seed uh, for the first book. I just, I was in his office and he said, hey, what do you think about a year long series on the seawall? And that's literally all he told me. Um, but I just was like, for some reason, it just sounded like the best idea ever in the whole world. And so I ran with it. And then that's ultimately how the Galveston Seawall Chronicles came to be. Um, but I also recently, or about a year ago, back in March of 2019, launched the Red Light District Tours of Galveston, mm -hmm. um, based on actually both of these books, based on the Red Light and the Maceo book. So because even though the Maceos weren't entrenched in prostitution, you really can't tell the story of the red light district without telling the story of the free state of Galveston. Yeah. So it's a really great kind of all inclusive, but as far as the places we see, most of those uh, focus on the red light district. Now, unfortunately I do have to throw this in just because I want everybody to be clear and I don't want you to be taken for a ride. There is a copycat tour out there. Oh no. So I just want, yeah. So I just want everyone to make sure that if you come uh, to my tour, that if you go to the website, which is just red light district tours of Galveston or rldtg.com, um, just make sure it says my name on the website yeah. um, or even uh, you can message me email me or you find are me on super Facebook. responsive you can get a hold of Kimber Fountain yeah. she puts herself all out there because she wants to connect you to Houston and Galveston yeah. history I keep saying Houston but obviously it's Galveston yeah. so focused. if you're worried you're gonna book the wrong tickets just send me an yeah. email send me a message and we'll make sure I'll send you the direct link so if you don't hear sure. her voice on the end of that line yeah you know, exactly you know, you know, getting you connected to and, I, and tours. I give all the tours personally you as do. well too yes and now right you, now I do yeah. you do something innovative so so I, I've got the pleasure of, of being the president for the Friends of the Texas uh, Room. Uh, I see Nancy Birch also tuned in earlier. Hey, Nancy Birch, what's going on? She's a buddy, and she, I think she might have answered the question right. We got to look and see, but you got you got close, and I think you got it right. Um, but. Uh, we have 4.5 million historical images in our collection over wow. at the Downtown Public Library, right there, Julius Addison Building. And when it comes to that, 
you know, I blow them up as phone boards and we show them to people as we're doing our tours. Yeah. But you're like 10 years ahead of me, right? What do you do on your tours that makes them unique and innovative that nobody can copy? Talk about that. Thank you. Well, originally I had the historic photos as well, but I had them on my iPad. I was displaying them on my iPad and I had this cool little thing with the handle, you know. But the thing is, is that my arm is not six feet long, <laughs> right? And since we've gotten, you know, a lot more um, uh, cognizant and aware of uh, what's going on in our world today with the COVID, uh, the Rona, as I like to call it, um, I, um, I have developed a system to where I actually send those historic images to the people on the tour directly. So you can view the images from your own device. That way you don't have to have my germs in your face to be able to right. look at, uh, to be able to look at the, um, uh, at the pictures and it's really neat people love it because these are historic photos so they have a lot of detail and so people can zoom in and not only that you can uh, take them with you, you know you they're on your device so even yeah. after the tour you can go back and look at them again if you're interested in them you know and so it was really kind of cool I was proud of myself for coming up with well, that you know and, 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 and you know of course master important social is important as well sure. if you're still doing tours uh, throughout the COVID process you're doing them in limited groups and they can get a hold of you um, how can people get a hold of you directly sure uh, the best way to get a hold of me directly is is either the Red Light District Tours of Galveston on Facebook, which is actually called the original yeah. Red Light District Tours of Galveston on Facebook. Um, actually, really the easiest way is just KimberFountain.com. If you go to KimberFountain.com, you'll find links to the tours, you'll find links to my books, you'll find links to everything there. Um, and I'm actually gonna be starting some new stuff coming up. I really, I have this thing, I wanna help uh, local writers as well. Oh. And so I really wanna start doing some virtual writing workshops and really helping uh, people who who are interested in, in researching and writing their own works, you know, and reach out to that way, uh, reach out that way as well. So that's really the easiest way. All my contact information is on there, but you can also directly contact me through Facebook. And you can follow her on social media, of course, yeah. um, you know, at author Kimber Fountains, which you look up under yeah. Facebook and then mm -hmm. you'll get her right away. She posts a lot of lectures that she gives around the area. So don't be afraid yeah. to follow her and learn more about local history. And please, please, if you can buy my books directly, they, they are from a nationwide publisher yeah. called Arcadia Publishing. So they are beautiful and pristine and professionally done. And you can get them everywhere. You can get them at Amazon. You can get, you can get them, them everywhere. Why but not, why not do it directly? Why not get them signed and, and also support a local author directly? Personalize, support local, get it to you a lot quicker because she'll give it to you right away. Uh, and then you can take her one of her tours. So yeah. thank you so much to Kimber Fountain for joining us thank here at the Heritage Society, Live Heritage Society at St. John Church. Um, lastly, I do want to invite you to like and follow Mr. McKinney's Historic Houston and uh, the Houston Houston History Bus. And the reason why is we do free tours. Like the Heritage Society, we partner with them, do free tours to educate people about Houston's uh, past on board the Houston History Bus. So speaking of tours, there you go. And we'll be launching our free tours coming up as obviously things get better, but you've got to like and follow our social media pages in order to do so. I only mention it because it is a free public service and you can learn more about local history. I want to thank Randy Pace for joining us and Nancy Birch and Will Howard, who's going to be joining us on August 8th. All these awesome folks. Uh, Michael Blower also joined us in on Facebook too. We are going to go through and find out who the winners are uh, for those because some people all had the same answer, but whoever had it first is the one who wins. And the great yeah. thing about Facebook Live is it tells you exactly what time you chimed in. Uh, and then you can go to Houston History Bus to learn more about the Houston History Bus as well. And of course, let's please be sure to follow and like the Heritage Society. We said that earlier in the start of it. Please make sure that you do that. The Heritage Society uh, is on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Easy to find. And if you do that, of course, you'll learn more about local history. Kudos to um, Alana, uh, Isaac, uh, Kian, Kai, and of course, our whole team that puts it together, especially Allison Aries Bells, is the Director for the Heritage Society and Manette Basil, who is our board chair. Um, and a last reminder, we have no show next Wednesday, July 29th at 7 p.m. Uh, sorry, no show next week, but the first one that we're gonna do rather is gonna be on Wednesday, July 29th at 7 p.m. It's gonna take you through the historic 1905 Stedai House. We're very excited about this. Uh, the house itself from Moreland, built in 1905 uh, with a 1915 um, Alf, um, Alfred C. Finn edition onto it as well. We're gonna have a really cool look inside. Lastly, good night. Thank you again for joining us. We went a little Thank bit over, you, but hey, we've got people still watching, so we appreciate those folks that stayed to the very end. Kimber Fountain, thanks again for joining us. Thank and, you, and, Mr. Uh, McKinney. Yeah, and take Pleasure care, Houston. Here. Bye, we'll Houston. See you. see you in Galveston. <laughs>